Breaking news now, live from New York, with your host, Mr. Wong. Good morning, class. Uh, this is your host, Mr. Wong. I'm just out here in New York. I have no idea why they keep sending me to the places that have the most victims of the coronavirus. That's why they gave me this mask. Actually, thanks to my mom. She actually made it for me. Thanks, mom. Shout out to the mom. Um, anywho, yes, yeah, so I'm in New York, and if you guys haven't heard, today um, was the worst day in the U.S. for the coronavirus. And what they're saying is New York is going crazy right now. So if you look, this is the Brooklyn Bridge. But in New York, the death rate and the coronavirus victims are now five times higher than anywhere else in the U.S. So New York has become an area where it is infected and it's really dangerous right now. Um, 56% of all the cases in all of the United States are now coming from New York. And 60% of all the new cases are all, 60% of the cases, the new cases are all from New York as well. Um, so New York has become the epicenter in the United States um, of the coronavirus. So we just have to always still make sure that we are washing our hands, staying safe, uh, do not touch your face. Thank goodness they gave me this mask over here from New York, but I just want to give you a quick little update of what's going on in New York. California, we are still going strong, we're doing okay. Um, but as soon as I get back, hopefully I don't bring the coronavirus back to LA because I wanna go back to school already. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna cut this thing short because I really do wanna get back to California where I know I can be safe at my house. So um, for today's news, thanks for listening. Alrighty guys, I am back safe at my house thanks to my private jet that they're hooking me up with. Um, they get me from point A to point B as soon as possible. Um, but before we begin our lesson today, I do want to say yesterday was the first day that everybody in our class turned in their work. So you guys are still the first class that have done, has done that since we started. So great job, 8th grade. This is why I know you guys are the best class and you guys are showing the response, how responsible you guys are. Um, first off, so this episode, I want to dedicate it to these people. So first off, Moises, um, I'm really happy that you finally signed on and you're starting to do your homework and that you are going to do a lot better now. So shout out to Moises. And another shout out to this guy, Sebas. I don't know what you were doing for the last week, but ever since I messaged your mom, now you finally started to do your homework. So good job. I don't know why you didn't do it before, but I'm happy that now you're engaged with the class. So shout out to you too. And lastly, shout out to the whole class once again. I appreciate all your hard work, all your patience and dedication. Um, we are going to get through this together. So shout outs to all you guys too. All right, so anywho, after a quick review, we'll get into new content. Um, so as a review yesterday, we talked about Madison and Marbury, and we talked about how this court case went and how Adams did something that was really mean to Jefferson. He put in 16 different judges right at the crack of dawn or crack of midnight, and Jefferson didn't know, and Adams was trying to pull a fast one on him just to get all the Federalists in. Fortunately, it was too late. Some people didn't get in, for example, Mulberry. And when he didn't get his papers, he took them to the court. Um, Marshall said, yeah, we'll hear the court case. But then when the Supreme, case, Supreme Court said, no, no, we don't hear just any cases. We only hear specific cases. This is when things start to go uh, a little bit south. Um, there was a lot of conflict between these people. Um, but in the end, they did solve the case. And what happened was it showed and we came up with this thing called the judicial review and the judicial review was when the judicial branch was able to now check the laws and make sure that they are in line with the constitution to make sure that they're not or to make sure that they are constitutional unfortunately this case was seen as unconstitutional and they didn't hear the case which was good and at the same time it starts to set like precedents on there to see what court cases what court cases the supreme court can actually hear um, so moving forward, that's what happened. And today, what we're going to do is that's kind of like the end of that section. We are going to jump into a new section, and it's called the Louisiana Purchase. And this is when we're going to start buying up the land and start moving out west. All right, because we know the west coast is the best coast. So here we go. All right, so as a quick review, here we go. Number one, what happened as a result of James Madison's refusal to deliver William Mulberry's appointment papers? So as a result, um, Mul Mulberry brought his court case and he asked the Supreme Court to see this case. And when he did this, he asked 
the Supreme Court to tell Madison to deliver his papers so he can get to work. And he said that this was possible under the Judiciary Act of 1789. Number two, why is the judicial review important? Okay, so at first, um, the judicial review is important because it gave the Supreme Court the power to declare any act of Congress unconstitutional. And not only did they do this, but it also strengthened the judicial branch's power. It also allowed them to keep all the other branches in check. Okay. And number three, um, explain the Supreme Court's ruling in the Mulberry versus Madison case. So the court ruled that they did not have the authority to hear the cases such as Mulberry's, and thus um, these laws, which the case was based on, was unconstitutional. So everything that they did was, everything was seen as unconstitutional. It strengthened the judicial branch, and it also gave the judicial branch of the Supreme Court the power to go ahead and check every single law to make sure it followed along with the Constitution. So today, like I said, we are going to talk about this thing called the Louisiana Purchase. Um, we're not going to talk all about it, but we're going to talk about um, how the American starts to move west and why we need to buy this new area of land. So as the 1800s began, the United States was expanding steadily westward. More lands were open, settlers moved in to occupy them, Americans were becoming curious about the vast lands that lay further west. Adventurous explorers organized expeditions to find out more about these lands. So yeah, population started to grow. People started it started to get too crowded on the East Coast. And with all this new land and with all these Native Americans kicked out, the new settlers decided, let's go and check out what's over there. What's across the Mississippi River? What's over those Appalachian Mountains? And let's go and venture out there because there's probably more land and more opportunity for us. So in the early 1800s, thousands of Americans started to go west and they started to settle in these areas um, between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. So you can kind of see it on the map, that orange area, okay? Um, as this region's population grew, um, so did the, some of the states. So they started to admit Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio, and they were now included into the United States. Um, and these settlers, they, re they really depended on the Mississippi River, which goes north and south, and then Ohio, which goes east and west. And pretty much the Mississippi River went all the way from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, at Mexico. And the Ohio River went from the Mississippi River all the way to like to New York, into those areas. So these Americans, they really relied on these ports and they are not the ports, excuse me. They relied heavily on these rivers. And in these rivers, they were um, sending goods up and down, uh, east and west, manufacturing goods, and eventually they would get to these ports, and then they would send it out to Europe. Um, there was one catch, though. Um, the Mississippi River, and, or Louisiana Purchase, or Louisiana, excuse me, the state of Louisiana, and Florida, and some of the other parts, the ports areas, were all owned by Spain. Okay, and what was going on was the Americans, like we know, they don't really care who's on the land. They're going to do their business. They're going to do what they need to do because this is the American way. They're just going to take what they need and do what they need. And they're going to look out for themselves. So Spain was getting real upset because they could not stop these Americans from using the ports and going up and down the river, going in and out of their territory. So like I said before, Spain controlled both New Orleans and Louisiana. Uh, New Orleans is in Louisiana. What, what's crazy is that um, this is where the Mississippi River ended. And then this is where their ports were. If you guys remember a long time ago, hopefully you do. This is one of the ports that was closed off by Spain as soon as the American Revolution was over. Um, so the Spanish, they opened it back up, but they really couldn't keep the Americans out because there were so many of them and population was booming. They were trading up and down and they also, Spain also got some of their goods and took it back to Spain, but it was most becoming a majority of American goods. So Spain, the prime minister of Spain decided, you know what, I can't handle these Americans. They're just uh, a headache to me. So secretly what he did was they signed this treaty with France. And France had this own little idea of their own, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but Spain agreed to sell the Louisiana, Louisiana to France. And this was done secretly. 
they didn't know they did not tell the people in france what was going on in these ports they didn't tell them that the americans were trying to take over they just secretly sold to them kind of like a hot potato they just didn't want the problems anymore and they're just going to pass it to somebody else and that's exactly what they did they passed all their problems to france and france had no idea what they're in store for so in 1802, right before uh, Spain was about to give France Louisiana, they decided to do a dirty move. They decided to close all the ports to the Americans. Kind of like what Adams did to Jefferson by appointing all these federal judges to let uh, Jefferson deal with the problem. Spain closed the ports down to all Americans and said, you know what, France, you go ahead and deal with their problems. So when they closed this, a lot of the Americans were worried. They were scared that they were going to lose business, that the economy was going to go down, and um, things weren't going to be the same anymore because the French were going to own it. So James Madison, or so Thomas Jefferson, as you remember, he has good relationships with France. So what he did was he sent James Madison and Robert Livingston over to France and tried to make some peace with them and try to see if they can still leave the ports open. At the time, though, uh, France was ruled by this crazy ruler his name was napoleon bonaparte and napoleon bonaparte he was the ruler that took over after the french revolution and he was this huge he was this powerful leader that wanted to create another empire and his whole dream and the reason why he took this area from spain was that he had this idea that he wants to build an empire in north america so he ruled a lot of france and he wanted to expand his empire in north america and what he wanted to do was he wanted to expand first off by using the Caribbean islands of Haiti. So when they got to Haiti, um, they started to try to take over, but the people in Haiti did not like that. So actually, um, all these enslaved Africans or these African slaves, they decided to revolt in the Caribbeans and France was not really fully on board with this because they were still fighting a war with Britain. They were still fighting a war with themselves. And then they tried to fight a war in the Caribbean. So the Caribbean was like the third war on their list. So they didn't really send that many people because they thought, ah, what are they going to do? They're just slaves and there's not that many people. But a matter of fact, that kind of bit them in the butt. And the slaves actually took over all uh, the slaves took over the French at that area. And pretty much when the slaves did this, this ended the hopes of rebuilding this empire that Napoleon wanted. So Napoleon was like, ah, whatever, I got to keep my eyes on the prize and I got to worry about France and Great Britain right now. So pretty much Napoleon was like, you know what, I'm done with this, plan's over. So the Americans sent over an ambassador to go meet with this guy named Charles Talleyrand, who was the French foreign minister. And they were negotiating this deal with France and America, trying to get this Louisi this whole territory, as you see now, which is outlined in purple with green. Um, so at this time, Napoleon was like, OK, I got to focus on my problems back home in France and in Great Britain. And you know what? I need we need money. We need money for this war. Because remember, war is not cheap. So what they did was they decided, hmm, let's go see if we can make some negotiations. If we sell the land, we'll have money for the war. Also, if we give this land to the U.S., they'll be almost nearly double their size and they'll be huge. They'll be more powerful. And maybe, just maybe, they're going to go and help us defeat the British because we're helping them out here. So Charles Talleyrand and they finally come to this agreement where they're going to sell all this land for $15 million, which is a great deal. Um, because $15 million, if you remember before, they gave like a few hundred thousand dollars to the Native Americans for a little bit of land. So if they got this for 15 million, that was a really good deal. Um, so France, they got $15 million in return um, for the land. They thought they needed this money for the war. And they also thought that the more big the US is, the more powerful they can be. And maybe they can help them take down Great Britain. So finally, on October 20th, 1803, the Senate finally approved the purchase of Louisiana, and this nearly doubled the size of the U.S. Um, so that's what was really important. And um, what was happening was because of all this new land, we have to start thinking of other consequences now. Since we have all this land, it's not uncharted. No one's really been over here yet, so it's uncharted territory. So you guys can only imagine what's going to happen with the Native Americans, with the people that are on this land, um, and with the Americans expanding, we know what's gonna happen. So we'll check in with that a little bit later. So as a quick review, um, the US needed to use 
the Mississippi River and the Ohio River. They're also getting very curious of what lays beyond those points, saying like, hmm, what's up with this other land? Because it looks pretty um, open. Maybe we can do some things. Also, it's getting way too crowded over here, so let's start to expand. Unfortunately, all this land was owned by Spain, and Spain really owned it, and they really couldn't take the U.S. out. So Spanish um, people, they did this secret trade with the French and passed over all their problems to the French. The French took this not knowing what the Americans were doing, and Napoleon Bonaparte, all he saw was perfect. More land, I can start to build my empire. Unfortunately, Napoleon Bonaparte was involved with so many wars in France and in Britain that he didn't really put his full effort into really building his empire. He got taken over by these slaves in the Caribbean in this country called Haiti. And eventually his whole idea of expanding to North America and building his empire went to the trash can. Um, eventually the U.S. saw this as a great opportunity. They go ahead and make some adjustments and go to to negotiate with Napoleon. Napoleon realizes we need the money and maybe with the bigger and powerful United States, it can help us defeat the British. So Napoleon finally does sell um, this whole area to the US for $15 million on October 20th in hopes that a powerful US would help take down the British and um, they could have money for the war. For the US, it was a benefit because now the US is more than double the size that it was before. And now with all this new land it becomes more opportunity and the US is just gonna keep expanding more and more west. So for homework, I want you guys to answer these questions. Number one, why were New Orleans and New Orleans and the Mississippi River important to the settlers in the West? Number two, why was the Louisiana Purchase important to the US? Number three, what are some possible results of expansion of the Louisiana Purchase? Alrighty guys, just to wrap this up for today, um, these stories that we're talking about in history, they're pretty interesting. A lot of this stuff is actually going on now, not really with um, taking over land, but this thing called gentrification. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. This is when they start to kind of push out the people that are living in these areas and new white settlers are coming in. And this is kind of what's going on in East LA, Boyle Heights, maybe some parts of downtown too is like that where you see all these new cafes or these new places opening up and people are just coming in and taking over and pushing everyone out. That's kind of like how um, this was going down in the US, which is kind of bad. So uh, don't think that this happened only back then. It still happens to this day, okay? Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment or check in with me through Google Classroom. If not, I'll see you guys in the Zoom session today um, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.